While many saw new advances such as Henry Ford's automobiles as the fulfillment of the promise of the American dream, many others, like Reverend Dr. Henry Van Dyke of Princeton, saw the advent of jazz music as a threat to that very way of life. As I understand it, it is not music at all. It is merely an irritation of the nerves of hearing, a sensual teasing of the strings of physical passion. Its fault lies not in syncopation, for that is a legitimate device when sparingly used. But jazz is an unmitigated cacophony, a combination of disagreeable sounds and complicated discords, a willful ugliness and a deliberate vulgarity. To some, it represented the deviant and even degenerate life of those who would spend their nights in the speakeasy, in smoky, dingy clubs, where men and women of varying races and creeds came together to dance and drink alcohol. In an article by Anne Shaw Faulkner entitled, Does Jazz Put the Sin in Syncopation? The author writes, we have all been taught to believe that music soothes the savage breast, but we have never stopped to consider that an entirely different type of music might invoke savage instincts. We have been content to accept all kinds of music and to admit music in all its phases into our homes, simply because it was music. It is true that frequently father and mother have preferred some old favorite song or dance or some aria from opera to the last bestseller which has found its way into the home circle. But after all, young people must be entertained and amused. And even the old-fashioned parents did not enjoy the dance music of the day. They felt it could really do no harm because it was music. Therefore, it is somewhat of a rude awakening for many of these parents to find that America is facing a most serious situation regarding its popular music. Welfare workers tell us that never in the history of our land have there been such immoral conditions among our young people. And in the surveys made by many organizations regarding these conditions, the blame is laid on jazz music and its evil influence on the young people of today. Never before have such outrageous dances been permitted in private as well as public ballrooms, and never has there been used for the accompaniment of the dance such a strange combination of tone and rhythm as that produced by the dance orchestras of today. Certainly, if this music is in any way responsible for the condition and for the immoral acts which can be traced to the influence of these dances, the speakeasy was the first place that jazz musicians, many of them African-American, could play. While that fact certainly didn't help bolster jazz's reputation, another new advance did. Radio. Large-scale broadcasting was introduced in 1922, and with it, so were many different varieties of music. Concerts and in-studio performances could be broadcast into homes nationwide, and audiences could hear jazz music without ever having to set foot into a speakeasy. While in the suburbs and rural areas, white jazz singers were still the preferred performers, if jazz music was broadcast at all. But in the city, especially New York and Chicago, artists like James P. Johnson and Louis Armstrong first made their way onto the airwaves and into the cultural landscape of the Roaring Twenties. While we can thank speakeasies and radio for the proliferation of jazz music in the 1920s, the owners, operators, and suppliers to speakeasies often dealt in trade of vices of all kinds gambling, drugs, and prostitution. Long before prohibition and the boom in organized crime realized by the illegal liquor trade, gangsters were the purveyors of the oldest profession. The social evil is as old as humanity. As far back as history gives any record, 
evidences of its existence and the subsequent terrible traffic are to be found. From savagery to modern civilization, women have been slaves to the brute that lives in man. They have been captured, sold for profit, and have had little to say. The Dark Ages are replete with data on this sad, shameful phase of life. The dawn of the Christian era, with its accompanying teaching of purity and chastity, introduced extreme asceticism. A radical stand was necessary where civilization had apparently gone sex mad. Brothels, bordellos, disorderly houses were some of the names used for houses of ill repute. Often, women, gambling, and booze could all be found in the same place, all of it owned and operated by gangsters, all of it virtually ignored by the police. Effective enforcement of laws against vice requires honest and efficient police officers. As long as houses of prostitution and individual prostitutes can be made to pay money for protection and freedom from arrest, police interference is merely a matter of expediency. It is a well-known fact, although seldom capable of legal proof, that police officers in most large cities have reaped profits from vice. Keepers of houses have told of paying thousands of dollars to the police for the privilege of opening resorts and for subsequent protection. If policemen were not bold enough themselves to collect the money, they employed an agent familiar with ways in the underworld. These sums varied according to the number of inmates in the house and the prices charged. Police knew whether the house was a $1 or a $10 house and whether it had 10 or 20 inmates. Girls renting rooms in assignation houses and managers and occupants of disorderly flats claimed the police levied directly upon them. A former captain of police in New York City confessed that officers in his district had exacted revenue from disorderly hotels and houses and that he had shared the proceeds of it. A police lieutenant who paid the penalty by death for the murder of a self-confessed gambler had profited from disorderly resorts as well as gambling houses and had instituted raids for no other purpose than that of exacting this tribute. At a hearing by the City Council of Chicago in 1912, after the closing of two vice districts and the dismissal of a number of police officials, the attorney for the organization prosecuting exploiters produced a page from a loose-leaf ledger showing that the small disorderly resort paid $210.51 a week for police protection. On that basis, he estimated the amount collected by the police from resorts in the district would be over $2 million a year. The earliest examples of corruption caused by organized crime in America came from the operations of the brothels in any given city's red light district. From locally elected officials to beat cops, government representatives worked hand in hand with gangsters to profit from prostitution with a system in place to appease the public's concerns and make it seem as if the law was being enforced. This came often at the expense of the working woman, as detailed in Maud Haddon's 1915 book, The Slavery of Prostitution. Women soliciting on the streets in New York City have told me freely that they had to pay for the privilege of walking on certain thoroughfares unmolested. They were obliged to confine their soliciting to well-defined districts, coextensive with the policeman's beat. When they went beyond such limits, they were liable to arrest. One girl who rebelled against the system said to me one evening in night court, I paid to walk in 34th Street, and I think it's a mean shame that I got pinched just because I happened to walk on 35th Street tonight. Although many have told stories of graft, few have given proof to substantiate their accusations. One evening, two girls who admitted that they were prostitutes entered a station house and complained against two detectives for demanding money from them under penalty of arrest. The officers had demanded a large sum, but had accepted three dollars when the women insisted they had no more. Women were often forced into prostitution or otherwise forced 
to remain prostitutes for fear of violent repercussions exacted by their pimps and other underworld figures. The power of the gang in controlling women is shown by the success of its leaders in compelling them to do their will. Two young women, Myrtle R. and Barbara H., after giving evidence against three gangsters, were so intimidated that they recanted all their testimony and were drawn back again under the control of the gang. For some time, they had been associated with members of the gang and had been earning money for them by prostitution. Doyle, who had had vowed vengeance upon the gang leader, Maiden, for stealing Myrtle away, was shot and killed in a saloon on the west side of New York City by two of Madden's men. The night of the killing, Barbara sat with a sailor lad at the table in the rear of the saloon, heard the shots fired, and when she ran from the saloon, she saw Madden across the street with his cap drawn over his eyes and his hands in his sweater pockets. Later, she joined Myrtle and Madden in the restaurant, which was the hangout of the gang. Myrtle went with Madden that night to a flat in West 30th Street, heard him tell how he had ordered his men to kill Doyle, and later listened to the story of the murder as told by the gunmen to their chief. At first, Myrtle was unwilling to tell the truth, declaring that she would be murdered if she did. Before the final trial, however, she had changed her mind. In spite of threats and piercing glances of gangsters, she told the true story on the witness stand. When the lawyer for the gunman questioned her severely, she explained, I've gone back to my church and my religion and have made up my mind to tell the truth. Conviction and sentence of the three men soon followed. The two gunmen were sentenced to 13 and 18 years and the gang leader Madden from 10 to 20 years. With the loss of its leader, the gang feared a loss of prestige and power. Threats constantly reached the two young women that they would be killed and that the gunmen had been offered $150 to shoot them. They complained of this to the district attorney and were sent out of the city. In a short time, however, the gang had gained control of them and had taken them away from their homes and had made them sign affidavits, retracting all the testimony by which they had sent the gunmen to prison. With the moral outrage of institutionalized prostitution also came damaging physical and mental health statistics. In 1921's Vice and Health Report, Dr. John Clarence Funk lists some gruesome statistics of the day. 33% of all prostitutes are feeble-minded. 90% of all syphilitic infections in men are derived from the prostitutes, either professional or amateur. 50% of all syphilitic women are infected innocently. 70% of women who came to the New York hospital for venereal disease treatment were respectable married women infected by their husbands. 85% of married women who have syphilis have contracted it from their husbands. 15% of all first admissions to the New York State Hospital for the Insane are traceable to syphilis. In spite of the detrimental effects to health and safety, prostitution continued to flourish. It remained a viable arm of many criminal operations. Al Capone is rumored to have had a dislike for the trade and tried to move the Chicago outfit away from the practice after he took over the operation. But the revenue from the cat houses couldn't be ignored. Like dancing and drinking, sex was becoming one of America's favorite pastimes. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.